Pat Mayo Experience, UFC Charlotte Jacare versus Brunson DraftKings picks and fight, fight, fight previews. But this is going to be the end of one Pat Mayo because why the fuck would you want me breaking down UFC? I don't know anything about it. So Paul Shaughnessy and Fight Network's Cody Saftik, the Dog or Pass podcast, will be taking it from here. Enjoy the show, give it a like, leave a review, and sub to the pod. All right? See ya. UFC Charlotte Jacare versus Brunson goes down this Saturday live on Fox. Welcome to another edition of the Dogger Pass podcast. Paul Shaughnessy here with my co-host Cody Safdick breaking down. We were talking about it just before a card that these Fox cards these have title fights. First time for UFC on Fox One, they had UF or they had uh, Cain Velasquez versus Junior Dos Santos for the heavyweight championship of the world. But even like top competitors, Clay Guida, Benson Henderson, like top lightweight. Yeah. You're looking at this car, dude. Honestly, it's like someone mailed it in. Let's put Drew Dober and uh, Frank Camacho in there. You want to know a funny stat about Drew Dober? What's nine, that? Nine fights in the UFC. Never once has he been on a main card. Biggest chin in the UFC. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I'm not talking about like his ability to take punishment. <laughs> That's pretty meh. But uh, his, he, he comes from, he must come from like Jay Leno's like family tree or something. Yeah, who knows? Like that a hell of a jawline on him. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see that when we talk <laughs> about that fight. You'll see the board for Drew Dober. And I, I, I wouldn't even say that you would be able to disagree with me because it's, it's a, it's a no, sight to see no for sure. There's no going on. Uh, either way, we talk about, we, we may complain, bitch, and whine about, you know, the quality of the card and all of that stuff. But... At the end of the day, we're here to break down fights, see where we can find an edge, try to make some money out of yeah. whatever there is. So well, I- I'm looking at this like the UFC is like, Fox, we should renegotiate. Fox like, no, 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 no. <laughs> well, we're out of this UFC business. UFC's like, give them Drew Dober on the main card. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're sending a message. Uh, before we jump into Could this, be. and very excited to jump into this, Paul, just got to get something off my chest. What's I that? told you so. Last weekend. What? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Plus, oh, we're hold up. Up. no, no, no. Let we're me gonna finish. Bring up the Let past. me finish. Let Why me finish. Are we in the past Let me finish. When we could be in the plus 165. I said wrestling would be the, the, the difference maker. Chael Sonnen, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I told you. <laughs> Anyways, let's move on. Chael Sonnen, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, you were one of the only people on on him at all. That I saw Rampage all week. Rampage is 250. You knew it'd be hard to take him down, but yeah. if he got taken down, he wasn't getting back And yeah, he gets taken down in round one. <laughs> yeah. Round two, he's just like, man, I don't want to get taken down. <laughs> yeah. And then he gets taken down and taken down. Yeah, Good call on that, man. There was most most people, and like even myself, I didn't bet on it, but uh, just from looking at it, I I thought Rampage. I just, no, after I, I, seeing Chael tap to Tito Ortiz, like it's tough to like anything. <laughs> Coming yeah. from Chael Sonnen, but you good. That was a sharp play. On last week's card, there was the Miocic's, there was the Dustin Ortiz, yeah. there was obviously Chael and the Beltro. When I'm looking at this card, we're about to jump into it. There's not a whole lot of dogs that are jumping at the page, but let's start off let's with that. Let's get in there. Yeah. We got uh, Jacare Souza taking on Derek Brunson. Second time these guys have fought against each other. Uh, Jacare Souza, 8,400 on DK. Derek Brunson, 7,800. Earlier in the week, Jacare was a bigger favorite. I've seen a lot of love for Derek Brunson. Lots of it. Who's looking for redemption after getting knocked out against uh, Jacare Souza back in Strike Force the first time that they fought? And uh, yeah, yeah, now it's getting close to a pick. It was minus 120 for uh, Jacare Souza, plus 100 for Brunson. Earlier in the week, it was like plus 150. And I, I can understand, uh, uh, t- uh, you know, taking Brunson there. The problem with Brunson, and like he looked great in his last fight against Machida, a little bit more patient. This is a thing that we have seen from him. He can knock out anybody on any given night it's if things power. are going well. But when that panic starts to sink in, what do, what happens? Hands down, runs forward like this, and he just runs into a punch. That's what happened the first time these two guys fought. That's exactly what happened. On DK, like I, I don't want to touch this uh, from a betting perspective. On DK, Brunson, he can hit hard. Uh, Jacare is 38, uh, 38 years old. Took a beating against Whitaker. Took some time off in between, so that's a good thing. But I, I think Brunson could, if, if he comes out like he did against Machida, a little bit more calm, a little bit more patient, waits for his spot, I think he can hit him. And I think he can hit him hard. Now, like, it's not a safe play, but I'm talking, like, GPP lineups. 
get get some Brunson in there for, for you. I, I can see the argument for Souza as well if you want to take him on your team. I'm just going to be leaning towards Brunson and hope that we catch we cash a uh, a knockout here. Yeah, no, I can see them both being good to, good plays on DraftKings yeah. because they're both pretty evenly like priced anyways. Like yeah. 7,800, 8,400. It's not bad pricing by the any stretch of the imagination. likelihood of it going five rounds isn't very high. That's the main thing is that one of these guys obviously has to win. It's two people in a fight. Somebody's going to come out to victor. And then the way Brunson fights is kill or be killed. I mean, yeah. he's got some massive amount of power for yep. 185 pounds. I mean, he hits like an absolute freight train. And if he goes out there the same way he normally fights outside of the Anderson Silva fight, he bull rushes you. He's either going to put you away and score a massive amount of points or he's going to die trying. And Jock Ray is going to score a massive amount of points. I see a lot of love coming in from Brunson. I almost feel like a lot of that love coming in from Brunson is people are looking at the card. There's not a whole lot of underdogs that no. they like. So when you were seeing the price for plus 130, plus 140, yeah, you know what? I like Brunson. A lot of people have doubted Brunson in the past, and the guy comes up big. You, it's really important to note, and listen, Jacques Ray is kind of guilty of the same thing, is that they both guys have actually fought a lot of cans. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I love Ed Herman, and I love Sam Alvey, and I love Roland Carnero, and I love these guys. But, you know, the Dan Kellys of the world and the Uriah Halls of the world, yeah, you're blasting these guys out in the first round, but these guys are B-level fighters. Now, Leota Machida, he's an A-level fighter, but maybe was an A-level fighter. He's been sitting on the sidelines for two years. He's nearing his 40th birthday. His chin, gone. And he didn't actually look all that bad until he got caught from Brunson, and he went down. Now, I know that Jacques Ray is 38 years old. I know that he's coming off a bad knockout loss himself, but still, I, I gotta look at Caliber, and I just feel like Jacques Ray, the fight won't hit the ground because Brunson's wrestling advantage is exactly. gonna get, it, it, it's good enough to keep him standing, but he's not gonna wanna use it to go to the ground. So it's gonna be stay standing. He's gonna bull rush forward. He's gonna do it exactly what he does, but look at the fight with him versus Whitaker. He tries to knock out Whitaker. He comes damn near close, but when he fails to do so, he falls apart. Yep. The Anderson fight, he's hesitant, and he falls apart. Yep. The Michida fight, you're right. He started off he with a little, a little bit more hesitant. He, he but hung the kill out a little shot bit landed. We don't know how that fight would have progressed had it kept going. Maybe the body kicks would have added up. Who knows True. what would have happened. With Jacare, I, I just got to feel like he realizes this well, is maybe Well, is hurrah. kind of the type of guy who pressures forward, too. These guys are going to clash. And then when the two of them clash against each other, who knows? Yeah, well, I, I know Jacare's striking has got better since the last mm -hmm. Both of their striking has gotten better since the last time. But mostly it's that in Jacques Ray's mind, he knows if I hit this guy with one well-timed counterpunch, I'm going to knock him out. I've done it before, I'll do it again. Yep. And, and with, with, with Brunson, you know, he's 34 years old as well. He's no spring chicken. People are looking at this guy like he's a prospect for some reason. Like, well, he might be able to get the next title shot. You know, he's rising up the ranks. He's 34. He's been around the block many of times already. You go back to his fight with Chris Lieben, which is an absolute stinker, and think about how long ago that was. Yeah. He's been around for a long time now. He needs this fight to get through to that next level. I just don't know what's going to happen. I keep going back to the Jacques Ray versus Romero fight, where Jacques Ray gets blasted in the first round, nailed with spinning back fist. He's hurt. And even though he lost that fight, I thought he won that fight. He's taken down Yul by the end. He's I thought, taken I thought, him into I thought the draw waters. was reasonable, though. Like, it was a 10 Well, he lost the like, fight. He, he damn near killed her. Romero damn near killed him in round one. And then round two and three, Jacques Ray definitely won. He should have won. That's what I mean. Even if you look so, at the third round. Okay, okay. If it was pride scoring, sure. it's a Jacques Ray win. But because of the 10-8 well, must system, let's use Yul a, a draw was reasonable. Let's use Yul Romero as the common denominator in those two fights, okay? In the Jacare fight, hurt early, Jacare rallies two and three, he's coming on strong, yeah. he gets better as the fight goes. If that goes five rounds, yeah. Okay, now the Brunson fight, he starts fast against Yule, and then he's faded by the round yeah. three. So in my mind, I honestly feel like there's five rounds to work with, Brunson's gonna have to fight. You don't just change the way you fight, especially when you have success. I know the Machito fight, he started a little bit differently, but the end result was all the same. So I feel like he tries to take Jacare out of there, fails to do so. People also, they're really quick to point out, man, Whitaker blasted Jacques Ray. It's not like it was a complete route. He looked in the first round and he got caught by Whitaker. How many guys get caught by Whitaker? The guy's a, a supreme talent. So this is the time for Jacques Ray. If you're Jacques Ray, he's thinking about retiring and I don't like that. But you're sitting on the sidelines and you think, okay, hey, Bisming's done. I mean, he, he's not ever conceivably fighting for a, a world title ever again. He's not even fighting a top five opponent ever again. He's gone. Now Whitaker's dealing with this life-threatening staff infection, so, so he's gone. And Kelvin Gastelum's not really a middleweight. And Chris Weidman's got a really bad neck. So you've got Yoel Romero is fighting for the title. A guy that I could conceivably beat against Luke Rockle, the guy that I've been campaigning for a rematch for a long time. If he beats Brunson, he can get that long, that, that long overdue title shot. So he's motivated. They're both motivated, clearly. But I think Jacques Ray will find a way to get the job done. It's not sexy. It's a hometown, it's a hometown fight for Brunson, though. Yeah, hometown fight hometown. for... Hometown... Yeah. It was funny. One last yeah, thing, one, one last thing I want to say, one last thing I want to say about this is that, like, yeah. 
he, it was funny on the the road to octagon series like i try to watch those when they come out just because yeah. sometimes you get a little bit of insight into what's going on in these guys camps and brunson he's watching it with somebody i forget who it was maybe one of his coaches or whatever he's watching the fight the first fight between the two of these guys and he goes oh look at me drop my head my hands down and rush forward with my chin up it's just and he's just like won't be doing that again it's just like yo, yo, derek yo. <laughs> you did that like every single fight like every single fight that you've lost it's because you went out there like an even, animal even a lot of he's a good he gpp wins, player that. for that reason like at all times just like if he lands and he's and he's rushing forward like a maniac things can go very well either way you like Souza. i kind of like brunson but that's only like gpp like i'll be playing him uh primarily on on DraftKings. But uh, I, I'm not going to be shocked either way. It's pretty no. much a pick them for a reason. I wouldn't parlay point. either of these guys up either. Like, no. they, it's, this is going to be a dicey fight, but you got to pick one side of the argument. I see a lot of love for Brunson, but I think I'm going to go the other way and go Jacques right here. Dennis Bermudez takes on Andre Feely. Uh, Dennis Bermudez, 8,600 on DK. Feely, 7,600. Uh, Bermudez, 155 on the betting line, plus 135 for Feely. Mr. Touchy Feely, well, what's see, your this, take? This is another real tough one, man, because honestly, line gets released. First of all, Dennis Bermuda is only 31. That's shocking to me. Like, it seems like this guy's been through the ringer multiple times, and it feels like he is slowing down. I mean, he's not becoming glass by no means. He's had some durability, but you look at that Stevens fight, which is just a crazy fight he gets knocked out in. And then subsequent to that, you know, he's getting caught by Lamas. That's the first one. He gets choked out by Lamas. Then he's getting knocked out by Korean Zombie. Then in his last fight against Darren Elkins, he just runs out of gas and gets out grinded. Like, you're, you're really seeing the holes and the flaws in this guy. I wanted to go with Andre Feely because, honestly, if Andre Feely is getting ready for Dennis Bermudez at Team Alpha Male, it's like, dude, the whole gym is hey, Dennis can Bermudez. Somebody, can somebody jump in and Can uh, anybody and mimic emulate? Dennis Bermudez? Yeah, we got Are you able to Dennis emulate? Him? one and fake Dennis Bermuda's number yeah. nine. Like, come on, they're all hey, fake Dennis hey, Bermuda's. You have, yeah, you have Emmett, you have uh, you have Chad Mendez, literally, oh. and then we have a bunch of. There's probably a bunch of other stocky oh. power wrestlers yeah, there that we've never even heard of before. Good shape, bro. Good Everybody shape, there not? can emulate that game plan. He's hanging out with, or Feely's hanging out with dudes on a daily basis that can do yeah, that yeah, exact yeah. type and, of style. And one of those dudes he's hanging out on a daily basis is the last guy to beat Dennis Bermuda. Is one Darren Elkins, who's yeah. coming off a sensational second Which was also on the road to the Octagon thing. He was yeah. walking through the fight with, like, what he can do. Yeah, it's just like, dude, just break his will. Because when the going gets tough, you, you could break this guy. That's kind of tough for Darren Elkins to tell you. Hey, you just have to break his will. It's just like, Darren Elkins, you are tougher than pretty much As anybody like, else in this Darren division. Elkins, you pretty much just broke my will while trying to explain <laughs> yeah, to me yeah. the game plan. Like, you're just grinding on me, mm -hmm. dude. Get to the point. No, listen, Elkins, is uh, that's what he does best. Uh, very few guys will be able to emulate a guy like Elkins. I get it. But with Dennis Bermudez, he's in a room with just, you know, or uh, when you're fighting Dennis Bermudez, you got a room of guys that you can work with. The thing is, and I look back on Andre Feely, his last two fights especially, the fight with Qatar, yeah, Qatar's okay. He got the big win over Burgos. I really didn't see that coming. But he got routed by a guy that's making a short notice debut that was kind of unheralded. Fair enough. But you look at the Lobov fight. That's a terrible, terrible, terrible fight where Feely is not looking good in rounds two and three. And he's got to rely on these stupid ass takedowns against Lobov. Can't stuff a takedown to save his life. And just, I'll just get the takedown and hold him down. Oh, okay, it stood up. Or, oh, he got back up. Or I'll just get another takedown. That's not going to work against Dennis Bermudez. No, definitely not. So if you got to get in a striking battle with Dennis Bermudez, who, by the way, has spent a lot of time sharpening his skills. Belmore Kickboxing Academy. He's sharper than you. He's faster than you. He's probably as good, if not a better wrestler than you. He's way more athletic than you. Is he a better striker, though? Well, what has Feely really shown you to show that he's some great striker? He hasn't really shown anything. He's not chinny, though. He's not chinny. He can take a shot. But at the same time, ben Dennis Bermudez, who probably doesn't have as good of a shot as Feely, is, is Andre Feely a power puncher? Is he going to take no. Dennis Bermudez out? No, no so, but volume, so volume over. Over, the, over, over a bit of time. And he can land, he can land, some, he can land some pretty powerful kicks. Yeah, fair. His kicks have some power to them. and I don't know. I Was just don't, I don't kick know. He's got to kick him in the head if he's going to take, take him out. I don't know if a shot ball. anymore. From Feely? We've seen this guy. We're not talking about elite dude, level like, strikers, man. We had we had the Korean zombie coming off. Korean of, zombie's a striker. Off of like He's hanging out, and doing nothing He's in the military striker. for for two years. Feely's one of those guys that kind of does everything well, but nothing. Came great. in, he took one shot. Bermudez took one shot, and he was he he folded like a cheap tent. Right. So I don't know. You think Andre Feely's gonna knock him out? Is that what I'm hearing it's here? It's possible. Well, then bet. Do I love it? No, I'm not betting it. <laughs> well, then I don't know why you're. Okay, fair enough. You gotta. We gotta look at all sides of the argument. I'm just. Say, I'm. I'm playing devil's advocate. Yeah. 
I'm, I'm, I'm more it, likely. I'm more likely to put uh, Feely on on my lineups. Yeah, I thought about it, dude, but then I looked at his last two Because I just don't fights. know if if I was to put Bermudez onto my lineups, sure. I have to be very confident that he's gonna be able to secure takedowns and and get well, takedown after take, takedown. And it's possible. Qatar was taking Feely down. And it's so possible, I but I think I think Feely. Yeah, but Qatar. Feely would have went into that fight not expecting that. It's a little bit different when you're expecting, like, Bermudez. He knows Bermudez is going to come across and try to take him down. No, see, that's the thing with Bermudez. He should come across and take you down, but he just doesn't. He gets into these stupid-ass striking battles, which doesn't favor him a lot of the time. But in a fight like this, it probably favors him. When he's fighting Korean Zombie, it's not going to favor him. You're trying to out-wrestle Darren Elkins, it's not going to favor you. But like I said, Andre Feely is just one of those guys that does nothing great. He's not a great wrestler. He's not a great submission guy. He's not a great striker. He does everything well. He's very well-rounded. But he doesn't fit the mold of a regular team alpha male guy because he's not short and stocky. He's that longer, rangier guy that's led to fight like those guys because those are the room and the guys he's with. I just honestly, the more I think about it, and I did like Feely. I like the fact that he's a dog and I got to get some dogs in this card. I don't see a whole lot of dogs in this card I like. So Feely's one of those guys that jumps up at you. But that fight with Lobov, literally, he's got nothing to offer, offer Lobov rounds two and three other than the, these desperation takedowns, which work. It's a terrible performance. It really is. And that's when I got thinking about Andre Feely. When he first jumped into the UFC, Paul, we all looked at this guy as a blue chip prospect. He looked good and he's getting better. And he takes out Gabriel Benitez with that sick head kick. And that's what you're talking about. Oh, maybe he can land some kicks. Maybe can do something but at some point or another the guy plateaued probably after he got that ridiculous neck tattoo he just stopped getting better you know he just he literally plateaued and now every time i see him he's as good as the time before or not of worse he's regressing so he's still young and he can still come out here in a win over dense bermudas and a co-main event slot on a, on a free fox card it would mean something and you would love to see that from him but he's untrustworthy at this point his last two fights really 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 proved to me that he's just untrustworthy so i would either yep, pass this I fight completely that. or i would take the faster better athlete which is Dennis Bermudez. The line's not crazy, so I would lean towards him. DK purposes probably avoid it because I don't think either guy scores huge, but I think the over hit. So if you're a if you're an over under kind of guy, I, I would think Feely's going to be pretty popular in GPP or like in GPP lineups because of the price. Seventy six hundred is cheap, and and Bermudez has proven to be chinny. Either way, let's go on to the next fight. Chinny against who? Elite level guys. Chinny against. Oh come on. Come on. Korean Zombie coming off of a two year layoff is elite. Wow, he's a good striker. He landed one punch. We, we would be on this all. Like, he okay, landed one punch. Enough, I just enough. don't think Bermudez can take a shot. So when you're playing GBP, it's like the opportunity for a knock knockout is there. Okay, fair. Is Feely going to do it? Who knows? It may not happen. But I agree to disagree. <laughs> we got uh, Gregor Gillespie taking on Jordan Rinaldi. Gregor Gillespie is the most expensive guy on the card. And I think for good, good reason. Rinald, uh, Gregor Gillespie, 9,500. Uh, Rinaldi, 6,700. Minus 570 on the betting line for Gillespie, plus 435 Rinaldi. This was straight up. I don't think we're going to disagree here. Gregor Gillespie is awesome. He, he's awesome. He looks good. He fights good. His Dude. wrestling credentials are the best in the UFC. He's undefeated. Let's keep this guy rolling. And you know what you do? You give him guys that he's going to look good against, and that's exactly what he's getting Jordan Rinaldi. This is no disrespect to Rinaldi. He's a tough guy. No, but he's, he's a guy good. that's been knocked out in the past. He's been submitted in the past. He's had an up-and-down career. He's one of the favorites he's, to win the Ultimate he's Fighter. He's bigger than Gillespie. Like, he's a, got a bigger frame. Gillespie's pretty small for 155. It doesn't matter. It don't matter. It and it helps matter. when you're a wrestler yeah. to be a little bit shorter, a little bit, you know, a little bit lower to the ground you can get to those hips that much faster. Yeah, see, the other thing, too, with Jordan Rinaldi is it's not like, well, it's it's wrestler versus striker and the striker's got a puncher's chance. It's yeah. like, no, Rinaldi's actually a wrestler, too, just not on the same level yeah. as a Gregor Gillespie. The one thing I'm thinking is is that when you're paying that kind of price on it, well, a straight money line, you got to parlay him. But if you're going to bet him on DK, you're going to need to finish. And is he just going to go out there and route Rinaldi? Rinaldi's a tough guy. You know, he went three rounds to Abel Trujillo. He uh, won his last fight against Albert Herr. It was mean, terrible, but... You need, you need a finish from Gillespie? For the price? I don't think you do. Well, because like think. if you're, what you're Rinaldi, hoping, what no, you're hoping multiple for multiple takedowns, is but he's not. Takedowns. He's gonna get a takedown, and then that's Rinaldi it. Rinaldi may be strong enough to get no. up a couple times early on. I he's think he's so. definitely bigger. It's gonna be one of those things where you getting up is you getting to all fours and then, just <laughs> and get, then, get, then getting, and then getting pounded. You know, watching like, that uh, the road to the octagon on him. Yeah. Like, dude, there's something for me at least about like watching. Like elite, elite wrestlers and their entries to take down. Like watching him just shoot on guys in the practice room is just like. 
So smooth. If it wasn't for a man, so smooth. If it wasn't for a man by the name of Jordan Burroughs, this guy'd be competing at the Olympics. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, for anybody like, who doesn't, for anyone who doesn't know, this guy is a four-time All-American, national champion, uh, one time, and like because of Jordan Burroughs. And then like he finished, and I think he had some like personal problems did, after yeah. that, and yeah. then he went and he started coaching, and then when he was coaching. Uh, some guys who were in MMA started being like, hey, you mind like, stepping in and like, you know, sparring with me? And he's just like, I started beating guys up when I was sparring, even though I wasn't like training boxing or anything like Supreme that. Supreme athlete. So then like, he's just like, why don't I try this out? I am like one of the best wrestlers you could ever find on paper. And uh, sure enough, a few years later, like now, like his last fight against uh, Holbrook, like knocking him out with his hands. And That's Holbrook. You want to talk about guys that are chinny? Holbrook is very. I'm much not saying chinny. he's going but, to but do it, but you're seeing that those finish. skills are coming yeah, very of course, quickly. Of course. Um, I think he rolls here. Rolls. There are some issues, like if he takes on a wrestler with some striking power, like I think he's always going to be able to get that takedown. But he is a little bit reckless on the feet, so that's something to look forward to. In the future, he may he may he may catch that L coming up at some point. But It'll happen. hey, if we It'll watch elite eventually. grapplers like Khabib and stuff, like if you're an elite grappler and you can control that position of the fight, you're you're alive in any single fight that you're that you're taking on. Either yeah. way, um, I think there's not really much else to say about that fight then. No, it also helps that he's in a he's got a good support system around him where it's not like one of those situations where, oh man, I just out wrestle everybody in the gym. It's like, dude, you train with some of the best guys on the planet and these guys are trying to knock you out. So I know what you're saying. He's a little reckless. I think he'll get caught eventually. This is just not eventually. It's MMA, it's supposed to get happen, but Ronaldo hasn't shown me enough to be like some incredible power puncher that's gonna stuff a couple takedowns and bop him up and hurt him. I just don't see it happening. Six fifty, crazy price. Uh, it was better earlier on the week. Minus but... 570. Okay, not bad. It'll get to 650. It's I'm fairly high, sure on that. Um, but yeah, if you, if you want to parlay a couple guys together, then this is going to be one of your parlay yep. pieces because he should be very much on the safe side. Absolutely. We got uh, Drew Dober taking on Frank Camacho. Drew Dober, 8,900 on DK. Camacho, 7,300. Minus 160 on the betting line. Plus 140, Camacho. This is an interesting fight. This is maybe at least on DK, one of the fights that will probably get a lot of attention in terms of people looking for underdogs. I'm not sure like why you would want to pay up for Dober at 8,900. I understand that both of these are, you know, Camacho fought at 170 before. He's moving up to 170, or sorry, he fought at 170 and then he's too small, so he moved down to 155. Hasn't been able to make weight, so then he's moving back up to 170 where he's undersized. Drew Dober's not exactly a huge welterweight, though. So no, Drew Dober's I think the got size... to say, I want to go back to 55. Yeah, so really like the size of these like guys, him. I think, is going to be pretty comparable. Um, striking, Dober is like an American kickboxing mm-hmm. champion. Yeah. So it, I think it'll be competitive on the feet. I just don't think, it's, especially the DK spread here, I think that's a little bit too wide. Like, I can understand why any why people would want to take a shot on Camacho here. Yeah. I think it could be a high-volume uh, type of fight. If we learned anything from Camacho's last fight against Damian Brown, the guy likes to throw them hands. And if he drags Dober into a bit of a firefight here... We could, uh, we could see a high-volume striking match, at least. Yeah, yeah. You made mention of Dober's chin, which I'm sure people have seen the board. If uh, I'm massive. sure most... He's fought in the UFC nine Ooh. times at this point. He's a veteran. You probably know. But if you don't know, now you know. And, and here's the thing, is that he's been knocked out once in his entire career, and it was in 2011, the seven years ago. Uh, he can take like a bunch. He's got Stonehenge on his face. Yeah, like, but that he, thing he, is he, he can take a punch. Whereas Frank Camacho, I mean, honestly, I really feel like he just falls apart. Now, his last fight against Damian Brown, uh, the first round, Damian Brown takes him down, right? And then I thought Brown wins the first round. And then the second and third round, Damian Brown just elects to get into a firefight, even though he's not a striker, and damn near almost wins still. I had Brown on DK, oh, and I was so screaming, I. just I was like, 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 you have, you, you seem to have, Camacho did uh, reverse him and, and put him in some real trouble at the end of the round, though. And listen, Camacho's got some big power, and he, he actually is fairly good in jiu-jitsu. Yeah. It's just, when you see him fight at 170, which is where he was competing beforehand, is that he's a brawler. Like, even though he seems to have, like, all, all the skills in the world, he's good at jiu-jitsu, he's got a lot of power, he seems to set, you know, he's got good punches, good kicks. When he gets in there and physically has to start fighting, he kind of leans toward more of that brawl style. I think it's a guy like Damian Brown who you can physically overpower, I meaning he's smaller than you, you are stronger than him, you missed weight. 
And all the keys for here is that I can I can outpower this guy, keep it standing, beat him up. And that's ultimately what happens. It's a close fight. He gets the decision. Fair enough. Against Drew Dober, Drew Dober is going to be way better standing than him. And honestly, yep. I feel like Drew Dober's got a much better gas tank. Training out of Colorado at altitude. He's going to have... Camacho gets tired, man. He gets tired often. The last time we seen him fight at 170 against Hung Yu Lim, or against uh, Jing Liang Lee, sorry, that, that size wears on him. He gets gassed out. Mm -hmm. Now, people will say, well... Well, Lee's a really big guy, and Drew Dober's not nearly as big. That's fair. But Drew Dober's going to push a much quicker pace. Well, Lee pushes a quick pace as well, actually. But that pace is what will tire Camacho. Camacho will have a good first round, no doubt about it. But he's got to land that kill shot early, and I don't think it's going to happen to Dober. Dober's actually improved a lot. I mean, outside of his loss to Olivier Obey Mercier, he knocks out J Josh Burke. And Obey Mercier's got that style that it's just style like he's going to take you down, and he's just going to grind you out. Yeah. Camacho yeah. doesn't have that game plan. Yeah. Are you paying up on DK for Dober, though? Well, I think, like I, I think you're selling the point that minus 160 on, on Drew Dober seems like a pretty decent play. Yeah. But 8,900, when you're looking for lots of points, maybe it's a cash game type of play. Maybe that's kind of what you're leading us towards here. But Yeah, cash game play. I'd take that. Because even though it's, it's like very GBP, pricey. What's, 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 his, what's his ceiling? Well, he's got multiple paths to victory. I think both of these guys are playable. He can, he's not going to submit him, but he can knock him out later on in the fight, and he can do it standing. If you look at the Berkman fight or the Jason Gonzalez fight, Anybody right? can beat Berkman at this stage in the game. And Jason Gonzalez, I get it. But you stand with these guys, and you get the knockout, it's good. But at the same time, you go back a couple fights, and you look at him take down Scott Holtzman. He takes down Holtzman, and he, he more or less gives him the grind. I think he can take down Camacho. I think he can keep it standing and beat him up. I think he's going to take him into deeper waters and get that third, fin that third round finish. Is it the first? round finish points that you might want no but at the same time if he gets some volume on there he breaks him down he throws some takedowns gets in the a couple mix. takedowns for a cash game play i'd be willing to take that yeah I don't, i'm not i'm not feeling dober i i think i'm paying up for uh for the some of the top guys we'll get we'll get to it a little bit later either way we got bobby green taking on eric coke coming up next uh bobby green 8500 eric coke 7700 minus 150 for green plus 130 for coke what's your take here well i've been riding uh the favorite so far and i, I think i'm gonna go the other way here now i get it i love bobby green who doesn't Both like of these bobby guys green? are very untrustworthy <laughs> they're so untrustworthy <laughs> i'm just gonna take the dog on this bobby green the path to beating eric coke by the way is taking him down we saw that with clay guida you take this guy down you can rip the spirit right out of him but if you want to stand with them there's no denying that he's got some good size even for 155 up from 145, he's got some good size for the division. He's a Duke Rufus kickboxer. He's a rangy guy. He's got some decent striking. Bobby Green's just super lackadaisical, man. There's no doubt he's got a lot of power. There's no doubt he's really slick. There's no doubt he somehow makes that shoulder roll he's work. He's talented. For him. He's a talented guy. He's just never been able to put that talent all together. But he's mostly just in there talking shit, pointing around. You know, Lando Venado almost took this guy out clean in the first round, but he survives, and then all of a sudden he's able to rally back. If it's not for that punch late in that third round against Lando Venado, that that kind of saves it for him that ends up getting the draw then who knows how that fight would have gone but because he's the smaller guy and he's got to play that range game in his coke coke might just outwork him and that's what makes me worried about here if i'm looking at a, if i'm looking at DraftKings perspective and i'm looking at bobby green you need bobby green to go out there and do what he's capable of doing and that's going out there and getting the knockout he just doesn't fight with any sense of urgency and, and when coke on the other hand coke's backs against the wall his last fight was a miserable performance where he knows I don't want to get taken down and grinded again. And Bobby Green's not a guy that's going to do that to you. So Co go out there Clay and just Clay Guida kick absolutely crushed him. He crushed him. But how good's Clay look these days, Clay's man? He's, he's looking really good. You know, it, it's entirely possible. Did they possible. resign Clay yet? Because they better have resigned Clay. They better Clay. have. I, I honestly feel like Clay would do the exact same thing to Bobby Green. You know what I mean? He would just blast double him to the ground. He'd figure out a way to if take he didn't him get down. The, if he didn't get the takedown, he would just outwork him. He just, he, dude, and that Bobby guy's got would work just stand it. there yeah, and yeah. just, and Clay would push him up against the cage and land like, you know, weird elbows and like kicks like over his back. Yeah. And, now the thing is, is that that shoulder roll works very well for Bobby if you're throwing a lot of punches. But yeah. kicks, that's the way to beat it. And we saw with with Dustin Poirier, he goes out there and he kicked the crap out of Bobby Green. Coke's a non, non, no nonsense guy, right? If he goes out there and fights similar to the way he fought two fights ago against Shane Campbell, I just feel like he's a little more versatile. Now, if Coke's on his back, everyone says he's got good jiu-jitsu, but that's the way to beat him. Put him on his back. People are also, they undervalue his, his offensive wrestling. If he gets on top, he can make something happen. Bobby Green is hard to take down, mostly because he fights with his hands by his side. He's always ready for yeah. take the shot, right? So 
I feel like on a card where I like a lot of the favorites, this is a very close fight. And because Coke looked so bad his last time out, and Bobby Green had a really fun fight against a fan favorite, and he himself is a fan favorite, the money's on Bobby Green in a fight that's probably a pick'em. And I just feel like if it's going to be a striking battle, give me the slightly more polished guy who's sure. got to have that urgency, who's going to outwork him. I think I'm going to make a play on Coke. My concern on DraftKings... <clears throat> is that we have a really, really low volume fight here. Mm -hmm. And this could be very, very low scoring. Even the winner could score like 50 points. And oh, that yeah. is not doing anything for you. Yeah. With Bobby Green kind of playing that lackadaisical approach, what if he just kind of keeps backing up, gets yeah. out-volumed, and he doesn't really seem to give a shit when he gets out-volumed and loses these types of things. Because in his mind, he's like, I'm winning this fight right now. He never now. gives a but shit. But nothing really yeah. happens, and all of a sudden... I think both sides of this, the coin here could be really, really low scoring. I don't really want much of it on DK. I can understand a, uh, a, dog, a dog play like you were saying on Eric Koch, though. Moving on down the car, we got Mursad Bektic taking on, uh, taking on Godofredo Pepe. Bektic, the second most expensive guy on the card, 9,400 on DK. And uh, Pepe to be had for 6,800. Minus 600 for Mursad Bektic. And plus 450 for Gato Fredo Pepe. Yeah, yeah. Um, Listen, lightning struck the last time against Bektic, and I just don't see it happening twice. Pepe yeah. is the kind of guy that's going to make crazy things happen, but I don't see it happening against Bektic. Bektic could, should be a top five guy in the world, but injuries have plagued him. He should be he should be there. That fight with Elkins, and we all know how good Elkins is. We all know how Elkins is on a crazy run right now. He's getting slaughtered for two rounds before he's able to come back against Bektic. Exactly. I'm not saying it's a fluke. I'm just saying that's Pepe, a fight you're dominating two rounds that you lose. I'm not going to be Pepe insanely shocked. shocked if I'd be shocked, I'd be surprised. I wouldn't be insanely shocked if, like, if Bektik takes him down really early and there's like a triangle that gets thrown up, okay, and, yeah, and, Bek fair, and Bektik fair, somehow yeah. gets submitted. Right, and you're right. just like, ah, oh, I knew that would happen, but like. I'm all. I think the more likely thing is Bektic will secure those takedowns, or maybe not even go to the ground and no, just like out take, you straight. Oh, cool, dude, why take why? take him down, start pounding him on down. him, and you take know the moment that that things start to go really bad for Pepe, he's going to be quitting. He is not getting to round three like uh, like Darren Elkins did, and and pulling off some sort of upset yeah. like that. If he took that type of punishment against uh, Mursad Bektic that that Elkins did, he would be gone. Yeah. He's gone halfway through round one, uh, taking that type of abuse. Yeah, well, so he, he tried I think that's what happens here. Bektic rolls. Go, uh, there could be a dicey moment early where you know, we know Pepe. He's just like he'll he'll throw up a flying triangle or he'll go no, for like two, a two pass to victory. He could literally Pepe. run across the cage and go for a flying knee, end up on his back. That's if he lands with that flying <laughs> knee, who knows? Crazy things happen in this sport. But if he doesn't and he lands up on his back, we're going to see the quits uh, sink in real quick. Yeah, no, Bektic would have to shoot a takedown into the flying knee. Yeah. That's a possibility because yes. Pepe throws a lot of flying shit and Bektic tends to throw himself into the And he gets himself hurt. But, but yeah, Del Darren Elkins literally had to withstand a lot in order to make that moment happen in yep. the third round. Pepe's just not going to do that. The thing that worries me as far as uh, DraftKings goes is that Bektic really hasn't really proven to be a finisher by no stretch. And Pepe, once he gets taken down, he's not getting back up. He's not even trying to get back up. He's trying to throw up triangles, trying to throw up arm bars, or he's just accepting the fact that... Yeah. yeah and get... you may not get very many advances because Pepe is decent. Is decent and like his jujitsu is okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, Pepe from his like, back. He's a submission yeah. artist. I don't know if I would say like he's positionally awesome mm. while he's down there, but like he may be able to just hold Bektic in guard, and Bektic may actually just be happy to be in guard and just try to land some ground and pound. Yeah, see, yeah. which you you kind of want the the advances and all of that to really compile points when people are taking other people down. Yeah, obviously I can't like read minds or anything, but when I see Pepe on the ground, this is what I think the thought process is. He's like, okay, try the triangle. No, he saw that coming. <laughs> I'm trying the arm bar. No, he saw that coming. 14,000 my base, 5,000 for Reebok, uh, uh, 19,000, a little sponsorship money, 20 costs, grand, 20 grand. It costs 5 years. grand a year for all the hair dye uh, that I yeah, use. Yeah, well, you know, 15,000 is not bad. Is the round almost done yet? Like, <laughs> he's, he's trying to submit you or yeah. he's letting it happen. Yeah. And the UFC realizes that they probably talk to guys at ATT and these guys all tell them, because we've been hearing it for a long time, Bektich is the man. Mm -hmm. 
This guy could be something. And he looked like the man against Darren Elkins, one of the hottest guys at uh, 145 pounds right now. Yeah, not hot look-wise, but yeah, for sure. I mean... <laughs> well, he had that purple hair there. He had that purple hair streak. <laughs> no, listen, Be- Bekdich is another one of these guys that he's kind of like uh, Gregor Gillespie. He looks good. He fights good. He's a highly touted prospect. He's He should be undefeated as well, but he's got that one loss, and it happens. you got to get the loss out of the way eventually. But they realize that they have something here, and in a division where you want to grow guys, you want to populate guys at 145 pounds, you need the next challenger for Max Holloway. You need to grow the division. I totally understand that. We gotta we gotta move this guy up the ladder. Let's not give him another stocky wrestler. Let's not give him a guy that's gonna pose him. Let's get his confidence back up. And oh wow, Pepe's actually still on the roster. Wow, you know he hasn't looked good in a number of years. Uh, remember remember we used to use those uh, before and after pictures of Pepe. Usada, mm-hmm. huh? Huh? Guy don't look yeah. the same. He don't fight the same anymore either. So let's just let's get him out of here and get Beckage back on track, and then that's what we're gonna go with. So that's how I kind of see this one playing out. The thing that kind of worries Magma. me, Mr. Magma, Mr. Magma, Godofredo Pepe. Yeah, the thing that kind of worries me ever so slightly I always... is that he's a parlay piece, <laughs> and I would parlay him and Gregor together with a couple it's other. Still pieces. not even a great price though. At no, that point. no. You gotta add somebody and you else get into the, the feeling into the that there. one of them my shit in the pot. Or the third person that you add into (laughs) that to get closer to even is going to be the one. Lorenz Larkin? No! Anyways, it happens, but I got to think Bektich is going to roll here. I really do. Same here. We got Caitlin Chikagian taking on Mara Romero Barella. Uh, Chikagian, 8,700 on DK. Barella, 7,500. Minus 150 Chikagian, plus 130 Barella. What's your take here? See, I want to go Caitlin Chikagian. I don't mind Caitlin Chikagian. I always compare her to a, a poor woman's Holly Holmes. She kind of got that same style, you know, stay on the outside, just a lot of volume, pitter patter punches, not a whole lot of power, but a good kick game, good range game. I like her. I think she'll be able to go out there and beat a lot of these girls. It's that fight with Liz Carmouche that you realize that the, the blueprint of beating her is out there. Just take this girl down and you can dominate her. When she fought Irene Aldana, she went one for 11 on takedown. So she's not even really, she got into a, a striking battle with a striker and she's trying to revert to a wrestling game. Game. When she takes on a rest, so she gets dominated on the ground. Barella, I wasn't high on her going into the fight with uh, no, Kalinda Faria. But in our defense, we didn't really know a whole lot about her. I mean, no. she's got a season and, like, record. She, she had taken on Milana Dudieva, who yeah. people who have listened yeah. to this for a long time. Yeah. If I see like a uh, you know a tough like three round split decision fight against Milana Dudieva, T Rex arms, yeah, yeah, cut. You're you're cut. basically dead to me. Yeah, cut. But with Barella, in her defense, well, not in her defense, when I'm looking at it on paper, she But she been... did what she had to do in that fight. She... Go out there, get the takedown. She took her down. Took her I down, think she yeah. had like three uh, three significant strikes in the fight. It didn't matter. She went straight for that back, found the choke, and like, that's, that's it. Game over. Yeah, and she's only, she's only listed as a blue belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but she looked very good with the oh, grappling yeah. game. She's also a black belt in Judo. Now, she lists herself as only training for five years, but you see a lot of these Italian fighters, whether it was Alessio Saccaro, whether it was Luigi Fioravanti, they come over, they go to American Top Team, that makes a world of difference for them. Now, they're the old guard, you know? Now their guy fights in the UFC anymore. They're that old generation, that first generation American Top Team guys. But she's that next generation. She's that Italian fighter that comes over. She's got a, a fairly good base with her ground game, but that's the key to winning here is the ground game. Now, like I said, you got a black belt in judo and just a blue belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, but if you can go in against Caitlin Jukagian, you could neutralize her by locking her up, getting a couple underhooks, pushing her up against the cage, grinding on her, using a foot sweep, get her to the ground, and then grind her on the Chikagian's, ground. That's the path to beating her. Yeah, Chikagian's basically Holly Holm light. Way less, way less athletic, same type of game plan, hangs out at distance, lands kind of, you know, low, low power strikes. Yeah. And she'll try to out-volume you. Yeah, but like Holm on DraftKings, take... we know what no, Morella's yeah. going to try to do Boy. is take is try to take Chikagian down. So I don't hate Barella as a play on DraftKings, 7,500. One of the dogs, we know her path to victory is get that takedown. If she does get the takedown, she may be able to get may, may be able to get another submission here early on. Fair. The one thing I don't like, I don't though, want Chukagian at all on DK. Like, I can't see her scoring over 87 87 points. Like, no, she won't get her value what's back. What's the way that that would ha- ever happen? Well, maybe way, maybe a cash game if you felt safe, no, the, but I don't, way, I don't like that that, at all. The way that that would happen was that we've seen Barella fight approximately four minutes in yeah. her UFC career, right? So what happens if she goes second and third round, whereas Ch- Caitlin Chikagian has got very good cardio, you know uh, what I mean? 100%. She can go three rounds. We, yeah. So if Barella takes her down in the first round and then tires out, we've never really seen her go into those deep waters. Caitlin Chikagian keeps the fight standing rounds two and three and is hitting a punching bag, then she'll score her point. Could be a I good just don't uh, really live, live bet opportunity there. 
Yeah, yeah. She's just got, not going to get... By the Barella, way... Barella gets a takedown. She's got good Dominates defense. round one. You see a plus 200 on Caitlyn Chukagian and uh, and throw something at that. Yeah, I don't mind it. But at the same time, I don't love the DK pricing. Uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to convince myself to take what a couple dogs. What don't you dogs. like about the DK pricing? Well, no. For Barella, 7,500. 7, yeah, 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 cheap. Yeah, but Caitlyn Chukagian, I don't think she's going to get submitted. She's grappled with better grapplers. She's worked a lot in her grappling. Her wrestling's not very good. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. I think it's completely plausible she gets taken down. Yeah. Once she gets taken down, she might not be able to get back up. Mm. But I don't think she gets submitted. And then, therefore, the second round's got to start, and the third round's got to start, and then she might be able to swing it into her favor. She was a highly touted prospect before Carmouche completely squashed that. So we'll see if she can kind of regain some of that a little bit. But if you're looking for a dog, Burrell is not the worst pick in the world. If you're looking for Kaylin Chukagian to score huge points on DK, don't see it. The betting line, it's probably going to be pretty close. I would probably say stay away from this fight. But again, yeah. if you're looking for a dog with a shot, Burrell does have a shot. Ronda Marcos, 8,800. Juliana Lima, 7,400. Marcos, minus 160. Lima, plus 130. Don't play this one on DraftKings. No. Don't touch Marcos. 8,800 Marcos? I think the most points she's ever scored was like 57 points or maybe like 62 or something like that. There is literally no chance she pays back her value on this. Yeah, well, I would I would guarantee the over hits. The only thing here about guaranteeing the oh, over Oh, the hits. over is happening. But, no, I, well, well, but it's, well, like, it's juiced well, to like minus 260. The over should, that would usually be my play here. However, it's very important to note that Juliana Lima broke the streak. Tisha Torres always hits the over. It's a guarantee. She went out there and blasted Juliana Lima. That's Untrustworthy. True. Meanwhile, Ronda Marcos, Canadian. Always got to cheer for the Canadian. Three and four in the UFC. However, she's got the Paul effect going on. She loses her debut. Then she wins her second fight. Then she lost her third fight. Then she wins her fourth fight. Then she loses her fifth fight. Then she wins her sixth fight. Coming off a loss. She's due for one, Paul. Right, I think she's going to win this fight. She doesn't fight. lose two in a row. I think she's going to win this fight. She's untrustworthy, though, man. But... What if she's not able to secure takedowns here? Now, Lima typically, you know, struggles against wrestlers. So that that that's something worth noting. But she's her, she she's herself, okay to hang off all, yeah, hang out on her yeah. back. But like she took on Carlos Sparza. And that was an awful fight. And Esparza didn't really give her any space or let her do anything. Esparza's got better takedowns than her, though, well, than, than, than Marcos. Marcos robbed Esparza. I didn't think she won that fight. I was happy she won that fight, but... She did not win that fight. No, and then she's complaining about the next time that she got robbed. Just like the MMA game giveth and the MMA game taketh away. It goes around. And go, what goes around comes around. Either way, don't play Ronda Marcos on DraftKings. That's that's terrible. Like, yeah. Don't even do it. Don't even yeah. think about it. Like even a contrarian play, no. It just is, there's, a bit, there's a fine line between contrarian and stupid. And playing Ronda Marcos at 8,800 is just straight up dumb. Yeah, the thing with Ronda, and once again, Canadian, I've always tried to rally behind her, but when she was training with Reno Belcastro in Windsor, it was like, oh, hey, there's a, another one of the good of Reno's prospects. I like it. But then she goes to Michigan. Then she goes to TriStar. Then she goes back to Michigan. Like, she's never really settled. She's 32 years old, which I think is shocking to a lot of people that, you know, she's nearing the end of her competitive career. She's 3-4 and four in the UFC. Like I said, she just kind of appears to be untrustworthy. Juliana Lima is another fighter that, you know, she's not a prospect by no stretch. We've seen her fight elite level competition and come up well short. So she's a better striker than Marcos. I say that because Marcos is very, like, you can see the punch come. It lands, but she throws one punch at a time, no combinations. Everything is super telegraphed. It's super predictable. She's a bully fighter. She can close that gap and she mm -hmm. just bully you. And with Lima. And she may be able to do that in this spot. She might be able to do that. But Jutai has worked a lot on her wrestling because that's typically how she's been trying to win these days. Look at the J.J. Aldrich fight. I'll just take this girl down. I don't want to stand with her. But she comes from a Muay Thai base. Mm -hmm. So if this fight's neutralized and it's both girls who are terrible at striking <laughs> attempting to strike it out for three rounds, the over's definitely hitting. Yeah. But do you want either side of this? Probably no. no. Justine Keish, 9,200. Ji Yoon Kim. Ji Yoon Kim. It's seven grand. Uh... Uh, Keish minus 280 plus 240 for Kim. Do you have any hot fire takes on this one? Yeah, hot fire takes. I'll never, ever, ever bit Ji Yoon Kim again after she blew it against Lucy Pudilova. Like, the worst game plan in the history of game plans. No fight IQ. Terrible cardio. Uh, it, it was brutal. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, it was brutal. I wouldn't touch it. Now, either. Justine Keish, for all the flaws she has, namely she has no striking defense, but she's so strong, Paul. And she's just reckless. Mm -hmm. And listen. You got to remember in this fight, though, we got Kim 
coming down from 135 to 125. We got Kish moving up from 115 yes. to yeah. uh, to 125. Yeah, and Kim's got like an eight Kim's inch got, reach yeah. advantage. Kim's <laughs> got like go go out. Like I can't understand how she has a 72 inch reach. Yeah, like I know. who? Like there's, there's, she has a longer reach than like Johnny Hendricks, who has like a 69 inch reach. Uh, Conor McGregor has a 74 inch reach. I think she has like the same reach as. There's some there's some real like big like middleweights that have like a 72 inch reach and somehow this 125 pound woman has a 72 inch reach. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. When well, her opponent has a 64 inch reach. So, but the problem is you can have all of that reach, but if like if you can't actually establish a jab that would actually hold your opponent from charging forward, what, it's, it's, what it's real the good charge. is it? It's the charge. It's the charge. Well, imagine, oh, this guy's got a 72-inch reach. He's just going to hit John Lineker. It's like, nah, 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 nah. Yeah, no. Nah, gonna... Jessica Andrade has got no reach. You yeah. just, nah, 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 Just because you have the reach Keish... doesn't mean that they're just going to walk right through it. Dude, Keish fights the same way. It's just like, let's do this. It's go time. It's like, oh, my God. She's she's just so strong, right? But but similar to, like, we are talking about Dustin Ortiz, they fight differently, don't get me wrong. But when we are talking about Dustin Ortiz last week, we said the one thing, he's got a knack for giving up his back it, and dude it happened pantoja was taking the back but he was able to do the things we were able that we knew he'd be able to do quiche gives up the back a lot and against someone like felice herrick she's able to take advantage of that she's able to take her down and then grapple her quiche is very very strong but she lacks a couple fundamental skills she gives definite openings and kim's not able to take advantage of those openings yep. kim wants a kickboxing match and quiche She's a striker by nature, but she's also so strong that she'll just rip her to the ground. One thing I thought very, I very you. notable against Kim is Kim's doing well against Pudilova. I thought in the first round, very close first round. Second round, I thought she beat Pudilova. In the third round, she just gives it up, man. She just completely fades on herself and quits. And also, Pudilova scores no takedowns, yet ends up on top because, you know, this girl just flops over. Keisha will be able to close that distance and land shots. She'll be able to take her down if she needs be. She's not a finisher, and this girl's actually very tough. So it's going to go the distance, in my opinion. I don't love it on DraftKings, but as far no. as as far as the betting line goes, I'm going to take some quiche here. I would have some quiche and hope she if this was a hope different... Hope she doesn't shit the betting. If this was a different card, I would maybe consider taking quiche in the spot. I do like her to win the fight, and I think she wins it pretty convincingly. But it could be a three-round uh, striking affair that she wins. Probably some decent volume. Well, you got Mursad Bektic and Gregor Gillespie on this card just slightly more than her. She'll probably be a contrarian play, but like both of those guys are kind of set up in spots that are looking pretty good, that look like high-scoring opportunities, and they're just a little bit more than her. And yeah. these are like high-end I prospects. Would, I would bet Kim if, and only if, the card was in South Korea. Because it could be a close-ish fight, and they could just justify giving her a couple rounds. Mm -hmm. But if this fight takes place in Russia, Keisha's going to win. Keisha's actually from Russia, adopted, lives in Carolina. So she's actually the hometown fighter, and well, she's going to get the nod. So that's just the way I see it. I think she wins it as well. I'm just saying on DraftKings, the price is just 9200 no, for Keisha. No, too much. It's hard. It's hard to fit her in, especially when Gillespie and Bektich are on the card. Let's move on down. This is probably my favorite... My favorite fight on the card, just from an entertainment standpoint. Vince from Hell Pichel taking on Joaquin Silva. Straight pick him across the board. 8,100 for both of these guys. Minus 110 for both of these guys. Who do you like? Uh, it's just another, this is a theme here, is that the card seems more or less very untrustworthy, is that uh, <laughs> Vince Pichel was off so long, man. And you were the one that notoriously called him over Anthony and mm -hmm. We were like, dude, I liked Njiquani, him in his last fight. I've always, been, I've always been a Vince, Vince Pichel truther, though. Yeah, you have. But then he takes, he had like a torn bicep prior to that fight. Then he sits yeah. out a couple of years. Then he comes back and he gets Damian Brown, who he just clocks and puts down, knocks out. Brown it's not easy. It's not easy. It's, it's not, not easy man. to knock him out like that. No, though. no, not easy at all. But you get, you only got such a, like a pint sized portion. We know the guy's very strong. Is his wrestling great? No, but he's so strong, he'll just power through it. Is his striking great? No, but he's so strong, he can just hit you and hurt you. We don't really know what we're getting out of him, right? Flip side to that with Joaquim Silva, he's undefeated. He's looked okay. He hasn't fought in that many good guys. This is a very, very, very tough fight to call. I think the line. Neto has BJJ it. is his name, but he's a striker. Yeah, I know, but it's hard to. One thing I like about Pichel, I'm, I'm taking a bunch of Pichel here. I, I can make, I can understand why people would like either side of this fight, but for DraftKings reasons, 
Fischel, when he doesn't have that striking advantage, he's secured like eight takedowns in two different fights. He'll go to that wrestling. If uh, if it's like if if things get too hot on the feet, he's gonna try to get the takedown. If B- Neto BJJ is able to stop that takedown, then then it may be a long night for uh, for Vince Pichel. But he's going to the he's going to those takedowns as a plan B. I'm not sure if Neto BJJ has that plan B, and if he is able to land four or five takedowns plus mix in some other things. And gets the win here. Like Pichel could could really really score well on DraftKings. Yeah, and I also feel like Pichel's gonna fight similar to the way Keish fights in the sense that he can just kind of he could take the shots and he'll just move through the fire and then he'll make it dicey for you. But if you're looking at for what we're getting from both guys, Pichel's been off for a very long time. So like I said, it's kind of an unknown. When you look at Neto BJJ, he he's I got he's got a three fights in the UFC. But Nazarino Malagari, right? Pretty tough guy, good grappler, very experienced. He's able to win that fight, close fight, able to win that fight. Hallbrook, very chinny, but he lands the kill shot and he puts him down. And then the fight with Rezmadotti, man. Rezmadotti's a bulldog. They call him the mad dog for a reason. He'll move forward. He'll strike with you. He'll try to take you down. Take him into deep waters, it's right? It's a close fight, a though. It's a very close fight. So that's why I can't really get a good read on this. Is he is he robbing these guys? No. Is he is he just doing enough to win the fight? Yeah. Vince Pichel's the American guy. This is going to be another close fight. Won't shock me if it's a split. There's a prop on this where is this fight going to be unanimous or a split? Probably going to be a split. I'd take, I'd take a crazy prop like that. It's just such a close fight that I don't love it. And as far as DK goes, the fight's going to go the distance. I feel it's going to go the distance. But once again, anything can I think happen. it could be high scoring, man. Yeah, well, I, I get what you're saying. It could be entertaining. If it is entertaining, If Pichel a lands a, gets a bunch of takedowns, like... I like him as a DK play here. If because I think the striking, like if the, the fire is gonna get hot, like Neto BJJ is no slouch on the feet. Pichel's gonna learn that pretty early, and then he's gonna start looking for those takedowns. He's gonna have to get those takedowns. Yeah. If he gets two takedowns in round one, and you know Silva gets up, then he's just like things weren't going very well on the feet. Let's go to the takedowns in round two and round three. I think the path is there for him to score over 100 points, yeah. even in the decision. So well, I'll that's tell you how what, I'm looking at it on DraftKings. On Tout Master, I'm going against Pichel. But as far as the betting line goes, it's a pass for me. And as far as DK goes, yeah, I guess you could see some value in both guys. But personally, when I was making some lineups, I just didn't really want to fit them in. Nico Price, 9,000. Uh, George Sullivan, 7,200. Nico Price, minus 320. George Sullivan plus 260. Let the record show that I have never picked a Nico Price fight correctly. I, I, got, I got the last I one, thankfully. Faded, but prior to that, I was getting killed. <laughs> faded him in what? His previous three wins yeah. over Joban, uh, Morono, and Fatch. <laughs> and then I was just like, maybe I've been wrong this whole time about him. I don't think that Nico Price is all that good. All right, I really like Luke, but I've been wrong about Price the whole time. And then he goes out against Luke and gets completely dominated. Takes that, takes that first loss of his career. So whatever I say here, you know what to do. It's fade that pick. So I, uh, in our tout master pool, I took Sullivan. I just think the Did line you? is really? too wide. Really? Too wide. I can understand. Sullivan's been, you know, he's gone. Uh, USADA, two two violations. He's been gone for like three years. I just think minus 320 on a guy that I don't like. I don't think he's actually very good. I think he's overachieved. He was getting boxed up against Alex Morono before he landed that kill shot at the end of round two. Um, Even Thatch is kicking his ass. He submitted Thatch, who, that's how you beat Thatch. He has the worst ground game in the UFC, or had the worst uh, ground game in the UFC before he got cut. And and then he knocked out Joban, who, let's be honest, Joban's pretty chinny. He gets, like, that. that is his, he's very technical, very skilled, but if you can land a kill shot on him, he's going, he's going, he's going to take a nap. So... Yeah. I think Nico Price has been over overvalued, overhyped, and I gun to my head if it was you know no odds, no pricing, nothing. I'm picking Nico Price here, but we'll see what uh, George Sullivan looks like coming coming into this fight. I think the line's too wide. I I think I I think Nico Price is going to be very popular on DraftKings. So this is kind of my little fade of him. I'm not going to be playing any Sullivan, but I'm just hoping that. 
that you know maybe Sullivan wins like a three round stand up decision, and that kills all the Nico Price lineups. That's kind of how I'm thinking of it here. But now that you know of my take on all of this, Nico Price probably gets a first round knockout, right? Yeah, well, I've never actually bet on Nico Price. <laughs> and as a result, I've gone one in three in Nico Price's fights. But I, I, think, I didn't bet on the. I think yeah, today, I didn't bet on the. I, I think today is the first time. Well, this would be the first time that I think I'm going to go with Nico Price. Listen, George Sullivan's been off for two years. You like not, the minus three? The minus 320, though. That line has just been flying. Yeah, out. but just because I don't like the line, I can't all of a sudden, oh, the line's no good. I got to take 36 year old George Sullivan been sitting on the, the sideline two years. By the way, two. Two positive saw tests. You know what that tells me? He's not taking any supplements because he ain't risking shit. He's not even taking protein, I bet. I bet you he's sitting at home like, dog, I ain't taking nothing. He got screwed too. He was supposed he to take get on screwed. Well, he was supposed to take on Hector Urbina. That oh, was Joe. This is three money. years ago. Free that money. was Joe Silva saying, like, here you go. Get a win. Yeah. Eat, yeah. Take this win. And he, he pissed hot, and then now they're bringing him back to take on Nico Price, a guy who they're probably, you know, he's done well. He's got three finishes. He's an exciting fighter. Um, he's, a, you know, they're trying to find him a win here, yeah. and uh, that's a much harder spot for George Sullivan, who has been chinny in the past as well. He made uh, he made Yakovlev look like the heavyweight championship or heavyweight champion of the world. Yeah, also he got butchered by Tim Means, which happens, but Tim Means usually takes you out quick. Like, this is like the third round you're falling apart against Tim Means. It, it's not a tough run, no doubt about it, but there's a difference between going out there and being 25 years old, being 27 years old, sitting out two years, coming back as a 29-year-old, being fine, and George Sullivan, who at 34, he was overachieving to be in the UFC to begin with. He had a decent little run where he fought mostly guys that were tailor-made to his style. Didn't look overly impressive, but still had a couple fun little wins. And then sitting the two years out on the sidelines and now coming back as a 36-year-old, it's pretty much done. Maybe they owe him a fight on his contract. I'm actually surprised that they didn't cut him. I don't think he actually purposely cheated on these USADA violations. It's just the way the cards fell for him. It wasn't meant to be. Now you're coming back. Oh, probably taking like it was like turbo max xl 6500 well then that would be his what do you fault think's inside he's, he's what do you think's that? inside of that no listen he comes from uh oh, Kurt these supplements team. these supplements are tainted it's just like turbo max to the to yeah like some of the, some of these things just like guys yeah if it's on clearance and it has the word diesel on it <laughs> yeah. don't, don't take it man yeah, it's exactly. gonna we're gonna pop almost guaranteed mm -hmm. right so i don't know but with nico price is that we we never really expect much. listen the fight with Thatch was the last time I was like, what the hell? But I think you nailed it. Thatch, I was actually thinking about the other day. Who has the worst ground game in the history of the UFC? Thatch or Art Jimerson? I'm thinking it's Thatch. Because boy, oh boy, is he terrible on the ground. And we've never put a single boxing glove on Brendan Thatch. Like, that wouldn't help him either. He'd be even worse. Yeah, you know what's funny is that Guy Metzger actually wore one glove when he fought Tito the first time. And he never gets no, slack, no, no flack whatsoever. Art Jimerson, it's like, no one's ever going to let it I still will never understand what was the, the mindset behind that. Uh, I, well, first of all, he didn't know what he was getting his own <laughs> into. <laughs> so why, why would you ever enter a fight with one boxing glove? When you're taking on guys with no gloves on either hand yeah i think it's because it's like well my jab hand i'm just gonna put a glove on it so i can keep him at bay jab, yeah i guess jab, it gives you jab, that extra and then my bare hand three. my bare hand straight right is gonna yeah. knock this cat out don't work that way no not at all in fact he got on the ground and he pulled a brand so you like crash. price yeah, I like Price because it's not like he's an overachiever who's just a bum. He's at he's at American Top Team, right? He's spending his time with he's a lot of high like level the guys. Cape Coral version of American. That's top what he's team. listed at. He goes to the full camp now Does in uh, in Coconut Creek. He's training with some of the best guys on the planet. And the fact is, is that he's a decent striker. He's a decent wrestler. He's a younger guy. Cardio is actually not bad. And even though we see like, oh, dude, Morono should have beat him. Oh, dude, that should have beat him. Oh, dude, Joe Ben should have beat him. He does find ways to win. I'll he give him He finds that. ways to win, man. And by the way, the all price three. Is wide, though. All three of those guys, and Vincente Luque, all four guys are better than George Sullivan, in my opinion. Morono would be the one that's iffy, but I still think he's better than them, yep. to be honest. So, I don't know, dude. I think Nico Price. The other thing you got to factor in, this is a factor people aren't talking about. But me, I'm all about those factors. 
Motherfucker's got four kids, Paul. <laughs> He's got mouths to feed. Nico Price has got to get the I think he runs like a win. lawn maintenance service. Because he has to. Stuff. I know. He could get a fight of the night, and he's still got to run that lawn maintenance. It don't matter. Nico Price needs this money, baby. He's not going to let George Sheldon come out here, take food out of them kids' mouth. So, yeah. Who was it? Mighty Mo on, like, a Bellator <laughs> card that one time? He's just like, I got kids. Dude, he's a modern-day like George Foreman. And then they Foreman. showed, like, some footage of, like, him with, like, nine kids. Oh, yeah. Just like, give that guy a bonus. Because they're like, man, you're 43. Why are you still fighting? Man, I got nine kids. <laughs> like, oh, shit, dude. Oh, shit. Give me Nico Price. Finally, we got uh, Corey Sanhagen, 8,300 on DK, taking on Austin Arnett, who is 7,900. The odds of this were released after the DraftKings oh, the price. The fight thing. was just added so late. Yeah, it was like a week. Like I think Sanhagen, Sanhagen fought, fought like a week and a half ago, or no, like a two, week ago. We're recording two on a Friday, a little bit late. I apologize to the fans that's yeah. coming on a Friday. He literally fought last week. Yeah. So he's minus, he's minus 220, uh, Austin Arnett, plus 180. The, uh, the odds and the DraftKings prices don't really line up here. So based on the price of Sandhagen, he should be, uh, you know, based on, his, uh, based on his odds, he should be much more expensive than 8,300. Is that going to lead some people to have a lot of Sandhagen? I'm not sure. I haven't even done all that much research on this one. Um, do, you have a, do you have a hot take? Do you think that either one of these guys are viable? Well, I'm going gut play. The thing with the gut play is that the odds don't really add up. Is that I I watched pretty much all the LFAs, and I didn't really remember Sanhagen. Then afterwards, I remembered, yeah, he fought Jamal Emers and got completely out-wrestled. But I didn't really remember him. Nothing notable. I watched last weekend's card, and he's fighting a schlub. Oh, dude, <laughs> he killed him. He yeah. literally killed him. And I remember sitting there being like, yeah, this, this Sanhagen, Sanhagen guy can go. Austin Arnett. He got signed after losing to Brandon Davis, who fought yeah, on last yeah. week's card against Kyle Bachnia. And I had to look at Brandon Davis' last fight, obviously, leading to last week's card. And I just wasn't really impressed with this Austin Arnett whatsoever. He's got a very fancy record, 15-3, and three, but there's no substance behind it. He's just yeah, and his impressive. fight with Brandon Davis was Ooh, like, you know, two guys... Throwing a lot of strikes. It was a high volume type of match, but yeah, like but I didn't, didn't see anything that I liked from either one yeah. of those guys. And Brandon Davis yeah. didn't show me like he's got a whole lot of power. But no. in the fight with Austin Arnett, Austin Arnett got hurt a couple times. He fell over a couple times. He didn't seem to have great balance. He didn't really seem to have. It wasn't like takedown defense was an issue, but he was just kind of flopping over and falling over. Yeah. He never got the contract. He lost the fight. Yeah. The other guy gets the contract. The other guy gets his ass kicked last week against Kyle Bokniak, right? Yeah. But all the same, they need a really last minute fight. Sanhagen looks so good. The UFC's like, hey, we need a guy. Last minute. This kid fought one week ago. He's on weight. He took no damage. Let's bring him in. Who can we bring in last moment? Well, let's just take this Austin Arnett kid. Basically, it's another Dana White contender series fight as the, as the curtain jerker for this terrible Fox card, right? That's what it is. This is a tryout. I don't think either guy signed four-year deals. But from what I saw from Sanhagen, he's got the power, he's got the striking, he's got the confidence, he's riding ultra high. If you're going to tell me that both guys are coming in a short notice, dude, one guy actually just fought last week. So his body's probably still in tip-top shape. Unless he went out and ate a bunch of double cheeseburgers, which... It's not uncommon for a lot of these guys. Who knows? But he made the weight. He looked fine at weigh-ins. I think he's going to go out there and I think he's going to beat up Austin Arnett. But once again, this is another case of me just going with my gut instinct here. Mm -hmm. I haven't I haven't sat there and analyzed You're not every convinced little... of it. It's just kind of what you think. The fight got added so late, it's like, shit, do I really want to waste my time and look at all this footage on both guys? Eh, I watched a lot of Austin Arnett's last fight because I watched the fight multiple times and I happened to watch uh, San Hagen's last fight live. But outside of that... Eh, do I really care? No, not really. The line, however, this is going to be more competitive. Well, maybe not. I like Sanhagen. I'm going to take a test on Sanhagen on a couple of GPPs. But Austin Arnett showed in his last fight that he can get he dropped. He's tough. Yeah, and he's a tough kid, dude. By the way, he's got, what, 18 pro fights experience. That's a lot of experience. Sanhagen's last opponent was 2-0. and It was a nobody. Right, but wrestling's the key to beating Sanhagen, and Austin Arnett's not a wrestler, so that's kind of why I'm gonna go with Sanhagen. The price is not great on it. There's though. a few spots on this card that like are gonna be relatively entertaining fights. Like the main event should be good. This is gonna be an entertaining fight. That's gonna be good. Bermudez Feely is interesting. Gregor, anytime you see Gregor Gillespie fight, yeah. I think it's something that you want to tune in for. Well, let's talk dogs because you got to show me Brunson, some dogs. Brunson Feely. 
Um, I'm not betting these guys, but like no, on DraftKings, people yeah, are yeah, fitting yeah. I in. I like Cope. Brunson could get an early knockout. We talked about Bermudez's ability to uh, not take punishment, so Feely is in the in the cards here. You're kind of taking me off the ledge with Camacho. I may have a sprinkle of him, but not very, like very him. much. Uh, Mara, Mara Romero Barella. Okay, I don't mind. If her. she's able to get that yeah, takedown, she can score a lot of points in this spot. Um, I don't want anything to do with the Ronda Marcos fight or Justine Quiche fight from a DraftKings perspective. I'm going with Pichel because we got that plan B. If things are not going on the feet, I'm hoping Pichel goes to that rest and secures some takedowns. But uh, Joaquin Silva, not an easy guy to take down. Yeah, so, so it'll be easy. very, very interesting. Um, I just hate Nico Price, and <laughs> I hate that I'm never able to be right about it. So that's why I picked I picked Sullivan and Toutmaster. You're just going to be just wrong so I can again. Be wrong oh. again. Keep the trend rolling, right? Um, but fair, like fair is fair. Like fair I know that what I'm getting myself into. Oh, that, this is a pretty that he's not very trustworthy. For the most part, um, it's it, a competitive card. Yeah, I may have some some Sandhagen, but uh, but yeah, so like Sandhagen and Barella and maybe a sprinkle of Coke and uh, and uh, we got that Gregor Gillespie and Mursad Bekdich, Derek Brunson, Andre Feely. Those are the eight nine people that I'm probably mixing and matching and putting into lineups this week yeah that's my issue is that i like jacare favorite i like bermuda's favorite gillespie favorite dover favorite where are you Coke gonna save Cody? where are you gonna Coke save my dog <laughs> i like Coke. back to should roll barella's got a shot marcos versus lima's so pass worthy but on tout i gotta make a pick i think that i'm gonna go lima i got one more day to look at some footage god i don't want to look at footage again but not Lima Marcos footage anyways. I want to watch Bellator tonight. Ah, uh, anyways, say la vie, Paul. Say la vie. That's, that's life. Anyway, yeah. that is it for us. Hope you enjoyed the show. Thanks to Pat Mayo behind the glass for doing all the uh, the awesome switching and cutting. Thanks to Sad Jamie for sitting in and watching the program. Uh, for Cody and Pat and Sad Jamie, I'm Paul Sh Paul Shaughnessy saying goodbye and good luck.